We're going to be in 1 John chapter 4, verse uh, 16, 17, and 18. Um, hard to get a running start at this. Uh, we've been following John as he's speaking about um, the importance of loving the brethren, loving one another. And Jesus takes that even farther and goes, you know, loving your, your enemies, your neighbors, you know, all of these people. But uh, John makes it clear through this section that this is an impossibility. It's, it's impossible to love your neighbor, to love your enemies, to, to love one another because of our fallen human nature. And it only becomes possible through the Lord Jesus Christ and his work in us and the Holy Spirit coming into us. And then it's not only made possible, it's made a directive, you know. This is a command. We are now the body of Christ down here on planet Earth. And so, you know, 1 John 4, he says in verse 7, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God. Here, here it is. And everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. He who does not love does not know God, for God is love. Then you look at verse 12 and it says, If we love one another, God abides in us and his love has been perfected in us. And we're going to be looking at that perfected love within us this morning. But just reading 16, 17, and 18, it says, And we know and believe the love that God has for us. God is love, and he who abides in love abides in God and God in him. Love has been perfected among us in this, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment, because as he is, so are we in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear, because fear involves torment. But he who fears has not been made perfect in love. All the way through this, John is stressing the importance of discipline, self discipline, of actually obeying, you know, doing what the scripture says, and facing our responsibility. And, and so many, I've met so many Christians, and they exclude themselves. Well, this isn't easy. Well, I've got this thing going on with these people, and this has come up, and that, you know, and uh, I just, you know, it, it's impossible to do this. But in verses 16 and 17, John is going to give us three reasons that would persuade us, should persuade us, should, you know, really persuade us that we want to be obedient in this. They, they all bring us to this point where we realize the importance of the consequence of our actions. You know, we must in this life constantly have eternity in view it's one of those things that's a must you know and so we know that cause produces effect it's the inevitable consequences of being saved of having the holy spirit move into you of having god now inside and him bringing change and reform and you know different things going on that this abiding and this abiding in love must come out of us. So the first thing I want to point to verse 16. Um, the idea is, well, I guess I'll read 16. And we have known and believed the love that God has for us. God is love, and he who abides in love abides in God, and God in him. You know, to dwell in love is the final proof. It's the final fact that God now dwells in us, and we in him. We could never love one another without him transforming our lives. You know, the natural man, the natural man can't do that. Oh, they want to think they can. And they, they have their special little group and they love on that little group. And oh, this is cool. As long as you agree with me and I agree with you, you know, we can get along great. But, uh, you know, there's always issues in that. 
the natural man, the, the man from Genesis chapter 3, after the fall, where sin now is in and selfishness is now, now sits on the throne of your life. And, you know, you cannot love like God wants you to love. It's, it's impossible, John says. But our world loves to pick out a few. Oh, look at the way this guy loves. Oh, look at the way, you know. They care and they love and they give. And, and I always smile about that. Because then you do a little research on their life and they've been divorced three times. I thought they could love. Wait a minute, what's going on here, you know? And, and then, uh, you know, they're involved in several lawsuits. And uh, they, they hate being around Christians. I can't stand those people, you know, or certain sects or groups or whatever. And, and um, you know, they, there's always these issues under the surface. But we want to keep those buried and just show our good side, you know. All that fallen nature. Man at his natural best hmm, is constantly proclaiming, I cannot love like that. That's all it says. The scripture from beginning to end tells us that mankind is evil, sold into sin. It's hating and, and, and just aggravated with one another. And it's only a select few that anyone can really get along with. Have you noticed that? You know, we got our little cliques where we fit in and we're at home. And, oh, I love to be around these people because they think the way I think and they agree with me. So that makes them right. And that makes them very smart. And so, you know, I'm getting along here. Great. But we only get along with them when they agree with us. When they disagree, we go, what's the matter with that guy? I thought he was on my team. So John says here, there is no point in saying that I dwell in love, that God dwells in me, and that I am in God unless we love the brother, unless we love one another. There's no point in, in make, putting up that facade, you know, saying I'm a Christian, I'm born anew, you know, I'm a partaker of the divine nature. But if you don't have this love, then you're self-deceived. You're living a lie. A lie. So are you aware of his presence? His influence? Are you sometimes amazed? Because, you know, most of us have been living longer than 20 years, you know. And we go along and something happens and the way you react to it. And now you look back and you go, man, that was crazy. You know, back in the good old days, I would have never reacted like that. That guy would still be laying there in a pool of blood, you know. That, I'd have, I'd have, something would have happened there, you know. And now you go, man, what? what is this? And you almost can't explain it to yourself. Why was I nice to that person? Why did I help them out? And then you come to realize, oh, wait a minute. That had to be God working through me, working in me, made me like that. <laughs> so if I am loving the brethren, right? If I am living in that life of love, then I am abiding in God and God is abiding in me. And the second point I want to bring up is in verse 17. He says, Love has been perfected among us in this, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment, because as he is, so are we in the world. Love has been perfected among us, or within us, you might say. Do you realize that the ultimate purpose of salvation was not to forgive your sins? Oh, thank God it's in there. Thank God it's the grand beginning of salvation. It's like the first step, but it is not the goal line of salvation. He longs for us, Christians, believers, his church, his called out ones, the ecclesia, you know, the church to become like 
his son. That's the goal line, you know? We are being conformed into the image of Christ. Our destination isn't just heaven. It isn't just a place. It's an image. It's an image. Our ultimate, our ultimate purpose of being saved by grace and coming into fellowship with the Father and with the Son is so that we may abide in love. Abide. Live there. Make our home there. That we may love one another and that we may be in this world as Christ is in heaven right now. Think about that. We're his body. He says that. He's the head. We're the body. His body, when he was down here, walked out in compassion and love. He left his body here. <laughs> Matter of speaking, right? That's you. That's me. Why did he leave us here? So we could walk out in love. And on Titus 2.14 it says, Who gave himself, Christ, who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from every lawless deed and purify for himself his own special people, zealous for good works. I wonder what those good works are. Zealous for love. Zealous to have compassion. Is that how you see your sanctification? You know, you know sanctification, it's this walk. Since we got saved, on our way to, you know, when God brings us home, there's this day-by-day -day walk, and it's, it's called sanctification. Do you understand it's, it's not just learning not to do certain things? <laughs> you ever know somebody like that? You ever know somebody, well, I don't drink, and I don't smoke, and I don't chew, and I don't hang around with girls who do, you know? And they think that makes them righteous. Have you ever met someone like that? I know some guys like that. Well, I don't do this and I don't do that. And, and Jesus never says, what don't you do? Jesus always says, what are you doing? <laughs> it's actually starting to do certain things. That's sanctification. The biblical test of sanctification is this. Am I like Christ? <laughs> Well, thanks for that, you know? Because you start feeling pretty good and then you compare yourself with Christ. And boom, you find out, boy, not doing too good this week, you know? The test of sanctification is our humility, not our pride. It's our humility. Are you aware of your constant failure? <laughs> I know we don't like to think about these things. Are you aware of it? You know? Are you aware of your total unworthiness? Of the darkness of your own soul way down inside? That means you are seeing clearly the difference between Christ Jesus our Lord and yourself. Sanctification isn't simply being delivered from certain sins. It's becoming more and more like our target. If loving the brethren and this idea of abiding in love isn't becoming the greatest concern of your daily walk, of your life down here, then you're manifesting that you're simply a babe in Christ. You're just, you're just a little beginner Christian. You know, a kindergartner. A kindergartner. However you say that. We've got to stop being so concerned about actions. I know so many in the world, like, why'd you do that? A Christian wouldn't do that, you know, and they go through all of these action things. 
we must become obsessed with this idea of becoming, in a sense, like Christ. Now, it can only be in a sense, because you'll never become like Christ. We must be about building the character in us that was the character of Christ. And then the third thing I want to point out is also in verse 17. Love has been perfected in us that in this that we may have boldness in the day of judgment. Boldness in the day of judgment. What a huge issue this should be. And yet how many people never want to think about it? <laughs> many in this world travel through this world totally oblivious, totally unconcerned about what lies at the end of life. I, I don't understand how they do it, you know? It's going to be a formal day. It's going to be a public day. And it's going to be a final day. We will stand before God as our judge. He's sitting on the throne. We're there face to face with him. And the books are going to be opened. And the investigation is going to be made. And then final judgment will be passed. Matthew 25, 31 says this. When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all his holy angels with him, then he will sit on his throne of glory and judgment follows that occasion. 2 Corinthians 5.10 For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. Notice that word. We must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. That each one may receive the things done in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. There's going to be rewards and there's going to be penalties. And of course, at that place, there is a difference made. There's a line drawn. There's the unbeliever, and then there's the believer. Of course, Christians, believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, their sins, their failures have already been judged upon the cross when Christ bore them for us. John says, I want you Christians to be able to stand in that day without fear. And that means, you know, this idea of torment or punishment or loss. You're sitting there shaking. Oh, I don't belong here. We should stand there in godly fear, absolutely. Awe and reverence and wonder at who we're standing before. But not physically afraid. How is that possible? If we want to stand here in boldness, in confidence, <laughs> not ashamed, we must be diligent, John tells us, in loving one another. Oh, do you see how this works? If I'm loving somebody else, if I'm loving you guys, and you guys are loving me, and I know that's a tough thing to do, love me. Because I've lived with me. I, I know I'm a little you know, quirky. Then that is proof that God is in you, helping you, causing you to love me. And God is in me, helping me and causing me to love you. That idea, that thought, that truth helps me to stand confidently today and go, God's already at work in me. God's already, you know, working in me and through me and for me and with me, you know? And that brings me confidence. He's changing my heart. He's changing the way I see people, you know? He's changing my outlook. John says, in effect, every action of your life matters. Matters. 
I must have this love within me. I must be diligent to take that love and work it out of me in the context of the people I'm surrounded with. And then we get to verse 18. And he, he brings in more. He's not just comfortable leaving it there. He says in verse 18, there is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear because fear involves torment. But he who fears has not been made perfect in love. John brings a negative. You ever notice that? We not only need to be told what to do, but what not to do. Remember the Ten Commandments? Some of them were good and some of them were, you know, negative, positive and negative. So he brings up fear. <laughs> fear. Torment. Loss. Rejection. You know? We begin to worry about being punished. Ever met anyone who's gone before a judge on a very serious matter. I remember I was like, I don't know, 22. I was out of work, I'd lost my job, we were starving to death, you know, and uh, child support office took me to court. So I was behind on my child support. And I remember sitting there, and here's the judge, and here's this kid. I'm sitting here talking to this kid next to me, and he's got, he's got a line of excuses. It's a mile long. I'm thinking, man, the judge is going to listen to that. He gets up, and he goes before the judge, and the judge pounds down the gavel, and he says, 30 days, and fear, fear rose up in old Marky's heart. Oh, he had all the best excuses. I got none, you know? And John says, anyone who has fear of judgment, of this judgment day, has not been made perfect in love. <sighs> what a strong, powerful statement that is. This, this may be the greatest test of where you stand with God you'll ever face. Just go home, get out your mirror, walk into the bathroom, look in that big old mirror, see that guy standing in that mirror, that girl, standing in that mirror. Imagine yourself standing before God right now, judgment day. Right now, as you are. Is there fear? Or is there confidence? <laughs> now remember, John's writing this to encourage believers, you guys, to encourage them, to comfort them, to cheer them up, to help them. John says something like this, if you look at it in the big picture, he says something like, you know, the people who are most happy and most comfortable and most free in this world are the people that are most comfortable with the coming of the next world. They know where they stand. The way to tell whether you're right at this moment is to place yourself there standing toe to toe with the Lord Jesus as judge, as king as master, as Lord. How does it make you feel? <laughs> John does this fun thing, and it's done all the way through the New Testament. He gives you doctrine, and then he tests you on that doctrine. Oh, you're a believer. Oh, you've received the Lord Jesus Christ as Lord and master. Oh, you've come to him by faith then this love is abiding in you. Let's see it worked out. How's it going for you? You know? If we are not, you know, aware, if we are not implementing, if we are not working out the salvation that he has put in us, we're self-deceived. We're not building our lives upon the rock. You remember the guy who built his life upon the rock? It's the one who hears the word of the Lord and implements the word of the Lord, applies it. No, no, we're, 
If we don't do that, we're just building our life on the shifting sands. So as we stand here at this judgment seat, the first thing we've got to do is divide the world because that's the first thing the Bible does. It divides the world. You know, it used to be Jew and Gentile, religious and irreligious. But now in this age, the church age, now it's unbelievers and believers, only two groups of people. And when the unbeliever, when the natural man stands there, the natural man, the, the guy who was born this way, you know, born in the sins of Adam. And so sin has a lock on him. Sin has a hold on him. He's fallen man. He's man without God. He's a lost soul. And then you have the Christian, the one who has believed, the one who has received. So when the natural man stands here, oh, there should be some fear. Not just some fear. should be terrified. Absolutely terrified. And you and I both know what that feels like. Because you and I weren't believers our whole life. We, we came to this place. And once we kind of realized, oh, you know, I remember when I first heard the gospel and that guy was saying, Christ died for your sins. If you will just receive him. You know, and I'm thinking, uh, all my sins, it was like they were on flashcards and they were just coming up before me, you know. And I'm like, I don't know what this guy is teaching, but I need what that guy is, is, is selling. You know, I need that. We were all once there. We all remember just knowing God. Knowing he's out there. Because I always believed there was a God. I had no idea who he was. But I knew he was out there. And I knew his demands were upon my life. And then I wasn't too good with that, you know. But there's a great deal of joking mocking about this judgment day. Have you, have you ever heard it? You know? Some, ta some, some want to tell you, well, you know, if God is a God of love, then he can't have judgment. That is totally irreconcilable. You know, they can't go together. And so they ridicule and there's sarcasm and there's all kinds of stuff going on. Others are unafraid because they have never put two and two together. They've never thought about it. They know nothing about it, never heard about it. I find that hard to believe, but never heard about it. As a child is unafraid to go out and play in the street because he doesn't know the dangers, they're out playing in the street because they're unaware of the danger. There are some who are oblivious through this life. They've never stopped and asked, why am I here? What's the meaning of life? What's going on? You know? What's the purpose of this? Others have heard from their conscience. You ever hear from your conscience? You know? I think it's interesting. John 16, 8, it says, And when he, the Holy Spirit, has come, he will convict the world of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment to come. There's right there's wrong, and there's coming a day when you're going to be held accountable for that. And some people's consciences are telling them that, but I don't know if you know anything about a conscience, but a conscience makes us all kind of cowards. Because it convicts you, and then you're like, I don't want to be convicted. And so you run somewhere else. You run into fear. You fear. And fear is like whistling in the dark. You ever been all alone? Maybe you just watched some scary movie. You hear some creaks in the house and you start, you know, Bill Cosby used to say, you know, he had that monster music and, and you start humming it to yourself because no monsters can come get you while you're humming music. I don't know how that works, but it, you know, whatever it was. 
The fact of eternity brings fear to unbelievers, not just a few, to all unbelievers. The idea of heaven and hell. Oh, I don't believe that. Well, okay, you want to dismiss it, but it's there in the back of your mind, isn't it? You know? It says terror follows these people around their whole life. So what do they do about it? Well, they get a drink or two, you know? They party. They... Uh, distract themselves they try to try to live a busy focused life so I don't have time to think about all of this stuff and religion can help them in that have you ever noticed religion loves to keep you busy so you don't think God loves to set you free so you have plenty of time to sit around and think you know amusement parks back when they when they first started you know Muse means to think, and you put the A in front of it, and it makes it the opposite, a place not to think. You never have to engage your brain at Disneyland. Never. It's all just fantasy, and oh, imagine this, and think about that. Hebrews 7.27, Hebrews 9.27 says this, and it is appointed for men, I think that's you and me, mankind, to die once, and after this, the judgment. Now notice, <sighs> judgment follows this life. It's what you did in this life. This life. The Bible knows nothing about a second chance. The Bible knows nothing about getting a second opportunity. This is your opportunity. When you die, judgment comes. And your eternal destiny will be decided on what you did on this world and what you did with this life, period. For me, as a kid, this idea was terrifying. Because I knew there was a God out there. I didn't really understand him, know anything about him, but I, I, was, I, I just had this natural thing inside me. I knew there was a God, you know? But, you know, I knew some of his standards and I didn't like them, you know? I'd heard the Ten Commandments. I'm not interested in those. So I'd been ignoring that. I'd even mocked him, laughed at him, you know, made jokes about him. And then I'd done worse. I'd cheated people. I'd hated people. And I had abused people. How does someone like that stand before the throne of a holy and righteous and all-powerful creator God? <laughs> With a lot of fear. That's how I would have stood there. Remember the parable, Matthew 18? We read it a couple weeks ago. I'm going to read it again just because it's good. He says, Therefore the kingdom of heaven is like a certain king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. Picture judgment day. Settling accounts. And when he had begun to settle the account, one was brought to him and owed him 10,000 talents. It's billions of dollars. <laughs> unable to pay that is you and me I have thousands of sins thousands of talents of sin but as he was unable to pay his master commanded that he should be sold and his wife and children and all that he had and that payment be made and the servant therefore fell down before him and said master have patience with me and I will pay it all. Funny how we think we can do that, right? The master of the servant was moved with compassion. That's our Lord. Released him and forgave him all, everything. 
But that servant went out and found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii, a hundred days' wage, $10,000, say today. And he laid his hands on him and took him by the throat, saying, Pay me what you owe. So his fellow servant fell down at his feet and begged him, saying the exact same words that he said to his Lord, Have patience with me, I will pay you all. But he would not. But he went and threw him into the prison till he had paid the debt. So when his fellow servants saw what had been done, they were grieved and came and told their master all that had been done. And when his master, after he had called him, said to him, you wicked servant, I forgave you all the debt because you begged me to. Should you not also have had compassion on your fellow servant just as I had pity on you? Should you not love your brethren just as I have loved you? And his master was angry and delivered him to the tormentors. I don't know what that is, but I don't like it. Until he should pay all that was due him. So my heavenly father will also do to you if each of you from his heart does not forgive his brother his trespasses. Boy, it is good to walk through a passage like this. Right? Where do we stand? Are we abiding in love? Are we loving the brethren? Do we love one another? Are we even praying for and trying to bless our enemies in some way? On Judgment Day, this is where you and I want to be living, abiding in love. So you look at the unbeliever, but then you come to the believer, to the Christian. And John says the Christian should be able to stand in that day with confidence, with boldness, <laughs> without fear. Is there any greater news you can receive down here on planet Earth than to know one day I can stand before God and not be afraid? <laughs> Hebrews 2.14 Inasmuch then as the children have partaken of flesh and blood, he himself likewise shared in the same, that through death he might destroy him who had the power over death, that is, the devil, and notice this, and release those who through the fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. One of the greatest things salvation does for the Christian is to release him from the bondage of fear. How amazing is that? That you can live tomorrow, no fear. No fear of the end of the world. No fear of going home. No fear. <sighs> Oh, if you're still fearing, did you hear what John said? To the believer, no fear. You can come and be set free from that bondage of fear. Boy, just look around the world these last two years. Just look around the world these last two years and the world has tried to make you absolutely terrified that you might die. I refuse to live in fear. People don't understand. Why aren't you wearing a mask? Why didn't you get your shots? Why, 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 why? You know, here comes all the, all the, because I'm going home anyway. Maybe this will just, you know, maybe I'll go home next week, next year. And they look at you. You're crazy. That means you're going to die. Yeah, it means I'm going home. And they totally don't get that. You guys get that.
How can you not be afraid? Because perfect love casts out fear. Perfect love. Have you been loved perfectly? Let me ask you a couple. Let me read a couple of statements from the Bible. Romans 8, 15. For you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you received the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. Daddy. Hey, I'm not scared of God, of the big man upstairs with all the power and he's sitting around just waiting to club people. That's not who I'm going home to. I'm going home to Daddy, Abba. Romans 8.23. Not only that, but we also have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves, grown within ourselves, eagerly waiting for the adoption, the redemption of the body, I'm looking forward to going home. I'm not just, you know, well, one of these days I'm going to die. Who knows what's on the end? No, no, that's a great day because I'm going to be redeemed on that day. This physical thing is going to be changed, transformed. Oh, I'm looking for that day. Romans 8, 28. Romans 8, 1. We, there is now, therefore, no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Is that where you stand? In Christ Jesus? No condemnation there. <laughs> oh, what high ground the believer stands on when he stands at the judgment seat of Christ. Not scared. That means glory. That means fulfillment. That means redemption. John is telling us that fear and love can not abide together. Because perfect love casts fear out. <laughs> Think of a young mother. She's got her little baby, and her little baby has got some sickness. And yet that mother goes in and grabs that baby and nurses that child and loves on that child and warms that child and does everything she can for that child. <gasps> what if you might get that sickness? Perfect love casts that out of there. Sorry, no fear here. This is my child. This is my love. There will be none of that junk getting in the way. Oh, Mark, aren't you scared to go around and visit sick people? Why would I be? Love and fear are complete opposites. Remember Christ when he sent out his disciples? <laughs> you guys are going out there into the world. It's going to be a little hard. They hate me. They're, they're going to hate you. You know, They persecuted me. They're, they're going to persecute you. Demons are going to be upset at you guys. And yet what does he say in Matthew 10, 28? Do not fear those who can kill the body, but cannot kill the soul, but rather fear him who is able to destroy both the soul and the body in hell. You know, Jesus says, you, you want a way to get rid of fear? Fear something greater than that fear. <laughs> Isn't that funny? You should fear the Lord more than that fear. Fear of the Lord is good it's clean and it's that reverential awe it's that knowing that all respect all honor all glory belong there but that he loves me he cares for me and that will drive fear out of your life if fear if christians are in fear it means that they're afraid of some loss, some punishment that's coming. And that just tells me there's something defective in their belief. Their whole understanding of salvation, their whole understanding of God's love is defective. They haven't seen it yet. They don't have it yet. It's not been made real to them. 
And it tells me they are not abiding in this love. Are you still in fear? Perfect love casts that out. How has God so loved you? Walk through it in your mind. Fear is gone. Walk through it in your mind. He sent Jesus. He sent him to be my propitiation. Upon that cross, he took my sins. Fear leaves because Christ has received me and I have received him. We must remind ourselves of those things constantly, right? Because this world, it wants you to live in fear. The ruler of this world, you know, the prince of the power of the air, Satan, he wants you to live in fear, in torment, and in, you know, bondage. And I was once a wretched, wicked, gross sinner. I was hell-bound, and it was well-earned. I had not loved God with all my heart, might, mind, and strength. Worse yet, I had ignored his calling upon my life. I knew he existed, but I refused him. I knew judgment day was coming, but I refused to think about it or take it seriously. I had become hard and selfish. But when I was yet in that condition, Christ died for me. The Father so loved me, he sent him. And he brought me from there in that darkness, in that putrid, putrefying petri dish of life. And he brought me into his kingdom. Into the kingdom of the Son of his love from darkness into light, into his family, and into his very heart and presence. That knowledge of perfect love casts out fear. So yeah, we see the love of God poured out for us, the love of God manifested towards us. And so, we, we bank on the doctrine of justification by faith alone and Christ alone, right? We bank on that. We're just solid. I'm standing right here. I love this doctrine. I'm not moving off of this. And it brings amazing comfort. Everything was done for me in the person and the work of Christ Jesus my Lord. You know, it's like Jude says. We, we should all memorize this, you know, Jude 24. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you faultless before his glory with exceeding joy. Don't, isn't, that, isn't that describing that day? Faultless before his glory with exceeding joy. Oh, that's going to bring some exceeding joy, all right. To God our Savior who alone is wise. Be glory, majesty, dominion, and power both now and forever. Amen. But the second point that John wants to bring out, you want assurance in that day, is to realize that as a partaker of his divine nature, that God himself has come to abide in you and you in him, therefore I'm becoming something like God now. Family resemblance is kind of rubbing off on me. Now I love God. Where'd that come from? It used to be, you know, suddenly this, something happened there, you know? And now I'm loving you guys. Who would do that? How, where'd that come from? I love the church. I love to read the scriptures. Imagine that. I even pray for some enemies of mine. I like prayer time. You guys like prayer time? Man, there are mornings I'm just I'm looking forward to getting in there. Yeah. Oh, these things were not natural to me. That must mean 
that God is in me and he's transforming me and he's at work and this is the outshowing of that work and, and you know some of my assurance is my changed life Oh, yeah, I'm justified by faith alone and Christ alone. Yep, I got that. But in my sanctification, in my walk, it is also helping me to see that God is already at work, that God already has me. He already so loves me, you know. <laughs> Isn't it great to stand before the the Lord at Judgment Day and say, love you, Lord. And just to be at peace in that place and have him look back and smile at you and go, love you too, buddy. Let's get this over with, you know. What a great place to stand. <laughs> so when your memory comes dragging all of your past sins, you know, your memory ever do that? You know, you wake up in the morning and here's the poof, you know. It's just like the, Satan's been just piling them on all night long. And you wake up and here's this overwhelming flood of junk that you've done in your life. We have this from our Lord. We have peace with him. There's no longer enmity between me and him. We have assurance. We have no condemnation. We have a changed life. And though quite imperfectly, as we walk this out down here on planet Earth, we can look back and go, man, I'd have never treated a guy like that, you know, 20 years ago, 15 years ago, five years ago six months ago. I'd have never done that. I'd have never walked away from that conversation and prayed for that guy. I would have never, you know. And now, I want to do it. It's abiding in me. I almost can't walk away without, oh, we better pray. Oh, I better say something. Oh, let me try to figure out how to bless this guy. And that is him in me causing me to will and to desire to do his good pleasure. And it is in that knowledge, Christ's work for me and Christ's work in me, that I stand at judgment day, not arrogant, confident, Right? Without fear. This is John's prescription for fear. If you're not yet sure. <laughs> Here's his prescription. What does it mention that you don't have? Is he in you? You in him? Maybe that's the first clue, right? How's that work? He says, come to him by faith. Come to him. That's how you receive. See, he's done it all. And he's holding it out to you. He says, do you have my son? Do you have the greatest gift ever given? That's the first step. And then Christ will manifest his love to you. And we will come to know that God is in us. You ever struggle with that? This idea of the mystical union. You and Christ. You and him. Matter of fact, it says you're seated with him on the throne in heaven right now. And you, How's that work? I, you know? And it says that he and the Father are in you. The Holy Spirit is in you. It's not some physical thing. It's this idea that, and one day you wake up and you realize 
God's been speaking to me. God's been moving me and directing me and guiding me and leading me. God's been at work in me. So this morning, I have communion. Communion. This idea of sitting at the Lord's table with Him. If you read your Bible correctly, it's this idea of Him and coming sitting at your table with you. Because now you abide with Him, He abides with you. And to abide means to be at home. It's where you're comfortable. It's where you long to be. It's where your heart is. You know, sure, we go out there in a the world and we get beat up by the world and this draws our attention and that draws our attention. But don't you love to come home? Homes where you're comfortable. Homes where you can be yourself. Homes where it's peaceful and whew, I can just relax and settle down here. That is to be our place with Christ. And that is to be his place with us. So communion is a celebration of the fact that we can sit down and share a meal together. We can sit down and fellowship. That's where the, the you know, early Christians, that's where they did everything was at the table. This is where you fellowshiped, you know? This is where you communed. And you know, so the picture's got to be alive and well. And so we're going to take the elements of communion. We're Imagine yourself there at the table. Jesus with his best friends. You've been invited, right? Same as it was in the upper room that last night. Seated there with him and he goes around and he puts on that towel. And he goes around and he washes your feet. Some of us don't think we belong there. Some of us are just happy to be there. Others of us are leaning back on the breast of our Lord. Great fellowship. Where do you see yourself? Can you even picture yourself there? And he takes that bread and he says, break you off a piece of this and eat this. For this represents my body, which is broken for you broken it's already happened it's about to happen it happens eternally you know once forever for all his perfect life perfection come down and put on a human shell walked around lived in the same kind of world we live in. All the sin, all the craziness, all the ungodliness. And he still takes that body to the cross, has it pierced there for you and for me. Because everything he saw in that world said that you and I needed his life because we couldn't do it ourselves. I remember, you know, he, he took the bread and he blessed it. God, would you bless this? God, would you bless, bless this bread that represents my life in these people's lives to strengthen and to encourage and to show? Father, we thank you for doing that. Jesus' name. And then he passed that cup around. And he made it a cup of fellowship. You see, this is my blood that was shed for you. This represents that. Ours is just grape juice, right? Represents his blood that was shed. It's the blood of the new covenant. It's the one that makes us come under his authority 
by faith, by trust. Old Testament, a lot of it was um, according to how you did. New Testament, it's all according to how he did and what he did and what he accomplished. And thank God he accomplished it all. Father, we thank you for the blood, that life that was willing to be poured out, spilled for us. Oh God, we do not deserve it. But God, we are grateful for it. So thank you, Father, for so loving us that you would send your only begotten Son, that whosoever would believe in him would have eternal life. We would have this knowledge of God and this fellowship with God and this fellowship with his Son, and we would know these things, not just a long life, but knowledge and understanding. Father, we praise you for that in Jesus' name. Amen.